sold her a five dollar shake. Mm -hmm. That's a shake. That's milk and ice cream. Last I heard. That's five dollars. You don't put bourbon in or nothing. A classic scene from Pulp Fiction, a surprise $200 million smash hit worldwide that earned seven Oscar nominations and worldwide acclaim for its 32-year-old director, Quentin Tarantino. But is Pulp Fiction really a watershed film? Is Quentin Tarantino, who has directed only two films, a one-man new wave or just a flavor of the month? That's the subject of the special edition of Siskel and Ebert called Pulp Faction, the Tarantino Generation. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Rarely in our years on the movie beat has a new director become as hot as fast as Quentin Tarantino. Even Martin Scorsese and Francis Coppola had warm-up periods. In his combination of public persona and directorial acclaim, he goes on the list with Spike Lee and Woody Allen. And to find the same combination of high-profile and hot first film, you'd have to go all the way back to Orson Welles. In Tarantino's case, it's a combination of two factors. He makes good movies, and he has a flair for self-promotion. So far, he's directed only two films, writing and acting in both of them. Here he is as a professional bank robber in his first picture, Reservoir Dogs, from 1992. You're not blind. You just got blood in your eyes, all right? And here's Tarantino in Pulp Fiction, none too happy that his friends have turned up at his house with a dead man in their car. Don't you realize, man, that if Bonnie comes home, and finds a dead body in her house, I'm gonna get divorced. Tarantino first made his name on the film festival circuit. Reservoir Dogs was discovered at Sundance and hailed at Cannes, and here he is last year at Cannes accepting the Palme d'Or, the festival's grand prize for Pulp Fiction. On this show, we may be asking, is there a danger here of too much too soon? Well, the, you know, the director that you haven't mentioned that he should be compared with in terms of being omnipresent and a public figure and a guest on talk shows is Alfred Hitchcock, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. That's the level of penetration yes, this guy is. is getting into the world. And why would a director like Spike Lee, who's a cutting-edge director, mm -hmm. use Tarantino? Mm -hmm. Because I think he embodies this Generation X in a way that you buy. You're buying the whole generation mm -hmm. and whatever it means, and no one can get a handle out of it. But he has the high energy, and he is right there representing, and that's why we're calling it the Tarantino generation, because it really is. He represents a moment in time. He's been called the first director who's a rock and roll star. Okay. Let's go back to 1992 to our first introduction to Tarantino and to the film he first directed and wrote, Reservoir Dogs, a bloody foul-mouthed howl that turns the crime film genre upside down, giving us a pack of thieves who are trying to figure out why their robbery went so terribly wrong. We were set up. The cops were there waiting for us. What? Nobody set anybody up. And what was our reaction to Reservoir Dogs then? Here's an excerpt from our original review. There are too many scenes of behavior and no scenes of insight. And as the guys assemble back at the warehouse, there's too much talk from characters who should really be unconscious or mad with pain instead of giving us all that dialogue. I liked the movie as far as it went. I wanted it to go further and try more. I had the same reaction, Roger. I thought it was a lot of an exercise in style. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I got that really quick. I mean, I understand what he's trying to do here, which, yeah. is, to, which is to show things in crime movies that crime movies uh, don't show. Mm -hmm. For example, the sloppiness, the humor. Uh, but we get that within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I stand by that review. We would await his next film, and it would deliver on the promise of Reservoir Dogs as Tarantino, working with writing partner Roger Avery, delivered an Oscar-winning script with Pulp Fiction, giving rise to a voice as original, I think, in the movies as David Mamet's work was a decade earlier in the American theater. Boy, is that a good comparison between Tarantino yeah. and Mamet, because in both cases, what they're giving us is something that superficially sounds like realistic dialogue, and the more closely you listen to it, the more you realize it's written, written dialogue. Yes. It's not recorded off the street. It's created as an imaginative work. And it has resonance in the kinds of things that are left out of other movies. Yes, it does. This, if, if we have to explain the phenomenon, and it's really there, and if there's some substance in his work, it is just like in the picture I didn't like and you didn't like, Reservoir Dogs, where he shows us the stuff that you don't get normally in mm -hmm, a crime mm -hmm, picture. Mm -hmm. Here you're hearing words you don't normally hear in American movies. Instead of the ordinary crime picture, which is on automatic pilot and all of the dialogue simply serves and pushes ahead the plot. When we come back, when they added up the best ten lists in 1994, compiled by hundreds of American film critics, the fiction film that placed highest was Pulp Fiction. Some people love it, some people hate it. We'll take a hard look at it 
when we come back. Continuing our special show on writer-director Quentin Tarantino, triggered by the success of his film Pulp Fiction, I'm sure some viewers are thinking, why are these guys devoting a whole half hour basically to just one film? Is it that important? Well, I think the answer is obviously yes. To begin with, the influential movies in Hollywood history are always the surprise hits. In the case of Pulp Fiction, you have a surprise hit of major proportion. A film that cost only about $8 million and yet grossed $100 million in North America, almost the same amount in the foreign box office, and revitalized John Travolta's sagging career. One drink, and that's it. Don't be rude. Drink your drink, but do it quickly. Say goodnight and go home. Another surprise about its wide acceptance, the film seemed exceedingly violent. Some argued it should have been rated NC-17 for adults only, but on close inspection, Pulp Fiction, as intense as it is, is not quite as violent as it seems. For example, take a look at this scene. Bruce Willis is about to eviscerate a guy with a samurai sword, but look, you see the swing of the sword, but not its contact because he's facing away from the camera. Then, the stabbing, but below the frame of the scene. You do not see the sword enter the body. Now, the violent intensity of Pulp Fiction calls to mind other violent watershed films that were considered classics in their time and still are. Hitchcock's Psycho, Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde, and Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Each film shook up a tired, bloated movie industry and used a world of lively lowlifes to reflect how dull other movies had become. And that, I predict, will be the ultimate honor for Pulp Fiction. Like all great films, it criticizes other movies. Roger and I have been witness to the ossification of American movies with their brittle formulas. Pulp Fiction is a refreshing mind bender. And audiences are saying they'd rather spend time with these creeps than with the boring straight people that occupy most American films. Boy, I agree with that, Gene. And you know, out in Hollywood, there are screenwriting workshops and books and outlines and computer programs that tell you exactly how to write a movie. And we're beginning to go to the movies and recognize movies that have been written yeah. out of these formulas. Yes. Here's a guy who comes along and says, throw away all that junk, let's make it up fresh. Yes, well, you know, he's talked about how he loves certain scenes, classic scenes mm -hmm. from other movies, and what he's done is just throw one after another. You've got it. Okay, I've looked at Pulp Fiction several times now, and during the week at the University of Virginia, I spent 10 hours going through it one shot at a time with a large group of students. I think there are several things that add to the movie's appeal. One is Tarantino's strategy of toying with the audience by delaying action and violence with humorous dialogue. In this scene, two hitmen are going on a job. They're discussing foot massage. They get to the apartment where their victims live, and instead of going in, they keep on talking. The camera, which has followed them this far, stays planted impatiently in front of the door, pivoting as they walk on, still talking. So look, just because I wouldn't get no man a foot massage, don't make it right for myself to throw Antoine off a building into a glass mother house up the way the nigga talks. That shit ain't right. What everybody notices is how the film's chronology is all mixed up. This isn't a linear narrative. It starts and ends by doubling back on itself to the same location, a coffee shop. I love you, I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! Every one of the major sequences in Pulp Fiction ends with a character being saved. But if you told the story in chronological order, that would get monotonous. This way, the audience stays on its toes. Oh, we absolutely stay on his toes. And I'm glad that you mentioned the sequence. I really think it is sort of a paradigm for the whole success of the mm -hmm. picture, which is that the killers talk personally about meaningless stuff before they go on their job. It's that extra scene, that extra yes. bit that would get lopped off by another kind of director, editor, mm -hmm. or production executive. He lets things run on mm -hmm. sloppy. It's those loose ends, which Andy Warhol, a, a great critic. Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol said that the outtakes of most pictures would be more interesting than what's put in a picture. Mm -hmm. Tarantino's success is devoted to the same thought process. Mm -hmm. Of course, not everyone likes Pulp Fiction as much as we do. Coming up next, we'll put some of the most common objections to the film to one of its stars, Samuel L. Jackson. You think we're obsessed with Tarantino and Pulp Fiction? This is just the tip of the iceberg. This movie has been as painstakingly analyzed as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Information Superhighway is just buzzing with worldwide discussions about every frame of this movie. Here are a couple of sample screens from the internet 
the World Wide Web, where there are dozens of Tarantino areas. Thousands of messages about Pulp Fiction have been sent and received for months now from all over the world. And reflecting the conviction of some people that Pulp Fiction has an underlying spiritual message, the Internet even has an online Church of Tarantino. What are some of the favorite details these people are analyzing? Well, of course, there's that infamous yeah. blowing briefcase. What's in it? Vincent. We never see, but people have countless theories. You happy? Yeah, we happy. And they notice that the yellow glow from the case is also seen at the moment the two hitmen shoot their victims. The case belongs to the crime boss, Marcellus Wallace. The combination on its lock is 666, the sign of the devil. Is Marcellus the devil? Take him to the kennel, sick the dogs on his ass. We'll find out for damn sure what he knows and what he don't. Some people think the Band-Aid on Marcellus's neck hides the number 666. Actually, it hides a scar on the neck of actor Ving Rhames, but try telling that to the Tarantino buffs. So much for the rabid fans of Pulp Fiction. What about its many detractors, people who saw it and loathed it, and people who object to the very idea of it? I recently asked one of the stars of the film, Samuel L. Jackson, about the most common negative reaction to Pulp Fiction, beginning with it being too violent. Actually, they killed six more people in Bullets Over Broadway than we killed in Pulp Fiction. So, take your pick. It celebrates um, people who are creeps. Well, Forrest Gump celebrates people who aren't as bright as we normally like people to be. Uh, it's just a story. It's a story about some people that you don't normally um, spend time with, but you get to spend time with them and find out a little bit about them. It has no moral center. Uh, the story is totally about redemption. Um, everyone in that script whose life is spared is given another chance to do something with their lives that hopefully they will do the right things with them. My favorite scene is when you, with a gun, are a peacemaker at the end of the picture. Yeah. The truth is, you're the weak, and I am the tyranny of evil men. But I'm trying, Ringo. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. When I first read it, I had a totally different take on it. And when I was at home preparing to audition for that scene, I was thinking of all these, you know, threatening things that I should do to this kid with this gun. Da -da -da -da. And during the audition process, when I started to do that speech, something happened. And I did something totally different from what I had prepared to do. And that's what ended up in the film the thing that I did that actually got me the job because that's when um, Lawrence Bender told me that they'd never seen the end of the film until I did that audition piece and they knew how the film was supposed to end. How do you explain the success of the picture? This is a hundred million dollar art film. Well, I actually think that it's, um, it's such a new and innovative concept to have actors on screen moving a story along with dialogue. You serious? You really thinking about quitting? For life? Yeah. Most definitely. What's you gonna do then? Basically, I'm just gonna walk the earth. What you mean, walk the earth? You know, like Cain in Kung Fu. Theater is a tell-me medium, and film is a show-me medium. But Quentin found a way to marry the two. Samuel L. Jackson, again, referring to the script of Pulp Fiction, a script I suspect that is going to become required reading in film schools across the country. Continuing our special show on Quentin Tarantino, he seemingly came out of nowhere, but now that he's arrived, people want to know where nowhere was. Well, he was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1963 to a woman who was half Cherokee and half Southern white. I couldn't find anything out about his father. She named him after Burt Reynolds' character Quint in Gunsmoke. They moved to Los Angeles when he was two, and she took him to the movies regularly. That love affair with film would continue with his early job in a video store in Manhattan Beach, California, which only added to his encyclopedic knowledge of movies. We've heard a lot of talk about the video generation, the wire generation, taking input from all kinds of sources, both high and low culture, and making something new out of it. That's what Tarantino seems to be doing, and I think he's going to be influential in freeing other filmmakers from the lockstep formulas of standard Hollywood screenplay outlines. Well, the imitations have already started. We've seen a bad one. Destiny turns on the radio. Let's hope in the future we see some done well. Coming up next, Quentin Tarantino, as we've mentioned, is everywhere these days. 
Is he spreading himself too thin? We'll try to give him some unrequested career advice. The doctors are in when we come back. We're calling this final segment, The Doctors Are In. Now, this is a free service that Gene and I sometimes provide here on Siskel and Ebert, where we examine the state of health of a movie person's career and then make our diagnosis. And in the case of Quentin Tarantino, my diagnosis would be, Quentin, you are overextended. And so the doctor's prescription, you should slow down and take care of business. And in your case, business should mean writing and directing movies not becoming a character actor and a talk show personality. I completely agree. If he is going to do all this extra stuff, and particularly on talk shows, I think he has to remember to always talk about the movies and what he sees as his vision for American movies. Mm -hmm. Use the vehicle of the talk show, not to just be a performer, but to talk about film. That's it for this special show. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of some big summer movies. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.